Are you looking to create your own Eurorack modules but find some of the electronics concepts intimidating? This video series may be just for you. In it, I'll cover a module that has some of the most basic electronics you'll find, the mixer. I'm Brian from Eurorack DIY, and I'm here to share with you how I make inexpensive Eurorack modules that sound and look great. In the previous video in this series, we covered the basic concepts of an audio mixer module and some of the electronics math that we'll need to know to understand how the mixer we're designing works. If you're unfamiliar with Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current law, I'd suggest going back and reviewing that video now. We also discovered that you can't simply add voltages by tying two or more inputs together, but instead you'll need a more complex active circuit, in this case an op amp. In this video, I'll cover some of the basics of op amps and how they can work to add multiple voltages in a mixer module. This is how an op amp will typically appear in schematic diagrams in circuits that we look at. While we see a minus sign and a plus sign on these two inputs, this is the, these are the inputs here, they do not indicate negative and positive voltages, but instead they indicate whether the output will invert the voltage or the signal seen uh, on the input, in, in the case of the negative one, or maintain it in the same, in the same uh, polarity on the positive input. Sometimes you'll see the voltage supplies drawn in at the op amp symbol itself. In this case, I've written in 12 volts, positive 12 volts and negative 12 volts, the typical voltages you'll see in a Euro rack system. And then this is the output of the op amp here. This is what an op amp data sheet looks like. And you'll see there's quite a bit of parameters and there's several more pages to this that talk about the operating characteristics and how the circuits uh, actually amplify things and what they do with their inputs and, and things like that. And we won't be using those characteristics as we analyze the circuits for the mixer design as we'll be assuming a ideal op amp. And what I mean by an ideal op amp is that we'll, we'll be making some assumptions about how the inputs and output behave that they don't, they don't exactly behave that way in the circuit, but it's close enough that it will, it's representative in a, in a good way to think about the circuit itself. And so what do I mean specifically by this? Uh, specifically, we're going to assume that the inputs have infinite impedance. It means that it looks like there's an infinite ohms resistor inside of here, which if we remember from Ohm's law, that would indicate that no current will flow into or out of these these pins on the uh, on the circuit. Also, what we'll assume is that the diff the, that the output is is it amplifies the difference in voltage be between these two inputs an infinite amount, and what that means is that that provided feedback some form of feedback into the circuit it will always try to attain a voltage here that will keep these two pins at the same voltage such that oftentimes we'll tie one of them to a reference like ground or zero volts would mean that the way the op amp would would operate is is have an output that whatever is here and whatever is on the rest of the input would e equal to zero volts here at this pin, and so it will change the voltage here to match that. And we'll see in a little bit how that actually works. There are several different common circuits used with op amps and types of feedback for them. In this particular case, for the mixer, the very first thing we're going to be looking at is an inverting op amp because that will be the type of configuration that we use on the input to the mixer before we start adding the voltages together as they come into the mixer. So we're back to our op amp symbol here. I've left off the voltage supply uh, pins or connections to it. But what we can see is that we have the non-inverting input tied to ground and the inverting input is fed via 100k ohm resistor feedback loop and we have 5 volts coming into the circuit through a um, 100k ohm resistor. Now to analyze the circuit and see what it's going to do, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to determine what is the voltage output uh, in this particular configuration. 
To do so, we're going to go ahead and apply Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current law and the things we talked about in terms of the characteristics of an ideal op amp to figure, to figure all of that out. The first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to note, we're going to note that via the second characteristic of an ideal op amp with a feedback loop, it's going to try to achieve an output here that through the feedback and the rest of the circuitry will maintain the voltage at these two points at exactly the same voltage. Because this, the non-inverting input is tied to ground, we know that this is zero volts, so we know that this will be zero volts and, and it will be zero volts at this position here. From that, we can know that there's a five volt drop across this particular resistor and We'll go ahead and denote it in that, in that case. And then we can use Ohm's law, specifically this, this version of it, where the current is equal to the, the volt, voltage divided by the resistance, to figure out that, plugging the numbers in, that the current across this resistor here is equal to the voltage 5 divided by 100,000 ohms. Or going ahead and dividing that out and solving it, we can go ahead and just move the decimal point across. If we write it like this, we know that decimal points here, there are one, two, three, four, five places we want to move it. One, two, three, four, five. So we'll go ahead and place it there. This portion of it is milli. And then if we look at this portion, it's called microamps. It's a, the letter mu. We talked about milli earlier. This is microamps. And so what we know is that the current across here is 50 microamps. So we'll go ahead and write that in here. And then the next thing that we can use is we can use Kirchhoff's current law to calculate the currents going into this node and, and they all will, will need to sum to zero volts. Now what we said earlier in the ideal model of the op amp is that it has infinite input impedance which means no current flows in or out. So we'll know that the current going in, in this direction out of, out of the node is zero. And then the other one that we'll have to, to, to figure out is the current coming through the feedback loop. And that, that's what we don't know at this point. So going ahead, looking at Kirk's, Kirchhoff's current law again, where you have the current sum to zero, we can take what we know about this circuit, 50 microamps plus zero, plus the feedback current will equal zero. Simplifying this, keep the feedback on the left-hand side. These two add to 50 microamps. Moving that over to the right-hand side, subtracting from both sides effectively, we know that the feedback current is, is going to be negative 50 microamps. That also means that there's negative 50 microamps flowing across this resistor this way. And so when we knew that this particular one, right, from zero volts to five volts, a potential difference of that caused 50 microamps to flow towards the negative, the, the, uh, the ground or the, the reference voltage, this one with the negative sign would end flowing towards that same reference voltage. We know that that will have, have the, the opposite voltage or the negative voltage of that. So we can infer from that that this will be negative five volts here at this point. As you can see, the 200 K ohm resistors here, they give basically unity gain to the circuit by using the same, the same resistor amount. It will always track just with a negative voltage. Whatever your voltage input here is, well, you'll get the negative voltage out in this particular configuration. And once again, we can go ahead and build this circuit in Falstad J Circuit JS. And I've already done so in this particular example to save the uh, time for drawing it out. The only difference here that we ha haven't seen yet is how we get grounds, uh, op amps, and then the voltage supply and an output voltage. But we've done the same thing here, showing the nine volts and also the ammeters showing the same 90 microamps flowing into this particular load node, minus 90 microamps flowing flowing in from this direction, and then it demonstrates how the output for the circuit is a negative nine volts. Now let's take a look at our inverting op amp circuit on the breadboard. First of all, our breadboard's a fair amount more complex now that we have the op amp itself on it. But another thing I wanna show is how I sometimes set up breadboards to be able to prototype your rack circuits. You need a plus and minus 12 volt power supply for it. So what I'll use is I'll use a 
USB connector. I wire that to a plus and minus 12 volt converter. I'll leave a link to uh, those on AliExpress below. They're, they're pretty handy to use and stuff. And then what I go ahead and do is I connect the negative voltage of that to the, to the bottom red rail, the positive 12 volts to the top rail, and then ground is the, is the two black rails on both the top and the bottom. So I have the op amp here, and it's in this orientation from this little printout here. And that shows that we need to wire the negative V in to pin four and the positive V in to pin eight. And then we're gonna use this section of the op amp here. And then as we looked at, our op amp circuit will have the non-inverting input grounded. So we've gone ahead and connected that pin to ground. And then we have the input will be at this point here, and it, it will go through the 100K ohm resistor into the inverting input, so that's pin two, so this 100K ohm resistor to the inverting input. The feedback resistor goes from the output to the inverting input, so it goes from pin one to pin two, and that's this resistor here. And then we'll measure the output voltage from ground to, to the output on pin one. So all we have left to do is go ahead and hook up our signal, which we'll simulate with a nine volt battery for this particular instance. We'll go ahead, hook the ground of the nine volt to the ground reference of our circuit. And then when we hook the positive nine volts up to the input, what we see is we get the inverted negative 9.53 volts on the output. Now we can finally look at the circuit we'll use to add our input voltages. It's actually not very different from the inverting op amp circuit we just analyzed. All we need to do to let it add a second voltage or third or even more is add another input, an input resistor of the same 100k ohm value. So the circuit looks very similar to the inverting op amp that we just talked about, but we have now added a second five volt signal through a 100k ohm resistor. The analysis will be very similar. We know that both these points are at zero volts because they're essentially one node. Even though there's a, a short circuit or, or a wire between them, they will be at the same voltage. And that voltage we know from the ideal op amp conditions will be zero volts. And so we had figured out before that when there was a five volt drop across a 100k ohm resistor that it meant that there was 50 microamps flowing through the circuit in this direction. And so we'll have that for both of these branches of the circuit now. Now what we need to do is go back and plug in Kirchhoff's current law. And we want to be able to solve for that. We also know that there's no current coming back out of here because of the infinite impedance uh, aspect of the uh, of the ideal model. So we'll want to know then what the current flowing here is. Well, because we knew before that when it was 50 microamps flowing into this node that it was negative 50 microamps. Now we have two 50 microamp currents flowing into the node. So we can reasonably assume that this is negative 100 microamps, which is what it will be. And that's what's flowing through the 100K ohm resistor at this point. So then we can go back to Ohm's law, the portion of it which says voltage is equal to current times resistance. And plugging in the numbers again, the current at negative 100 microamps times 100K, oops, 100K, and we know negative 100 microamps will be 0 0.001 times 100000. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Again, we have five zeros here, so we're gonna move the decimal place over five times here. And just write it out here so we can see how that will go down. So one, two, three, four, five. And so the decimal point goes here. And what we'll find from that is that the voltage is equal to 10 volts. Looking back, we have five volts and five volts, and so we have now added, effectively added those two five volt voltages together to get 10 volts. And again, we can use circuit JS to show the additional input. 
and now we have the two inputs flowing at 90 microamps into this node. We can see the negative 180 microamps going back and an output voltage of minus 18 volts. This is again an ideal op amp and as we'll see when we put this on the breadboard that we can't achieve this because we're only going to be able to get the voltage that's available to the op amp itself in the voltage supplies. Let's uh, look at that next. So now it's a pretty simple matter to modify our inverting op amp circuit to be an inverting su or a summing inverting op amp circuit. All we have to do is add another 100k ohm resistor as as an input source. And then we can go back and use our batteries again as our signal to represent the the signal. And when we hook the first one up, we'll see our negative 9 volts on the inverting input, or being the invert inversion of the 9 volts of it. And then when we hook our second one up to the other input, now when we look at the output voltage, we see that it's limited to near the 12 volt supply rail. This shows one of the limitations of a non-ideal or real op amp. It can't achieve output voltages outside of the range of its supply voltage. As we build a mixer with increasing numbers of inputs, adding all those inputs together will eventually hit these limits. Now that we can see that our circuit can only produce voltages as high as the voltage supplies we have available, in the case of a Eurorack module, plus and minus 12 volts, and also thinking what would happen if we add together two, three, or even more signals, it becomes clear that we will need more controls on the levels of the signals as they enter our module. We'll do that with variable resistors. I'll show how we incorporate them in the next video. If you're interested in continuing to get this kind of content, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or things you'd like to see in the future, please leave a comment. And I love hearing about the DIY projects everyone out there is working on themselves. Finally, I'm also on Instagram at EuroRackDIY, so drop by there too.